Hello again, everybody. I'm Scott Casper. This, of course, Tony Hager, Wayne Eric Boyd along the way as well. This is Global Wrestling News. We go to last weekend, the action that took place. The 13th-ranked Wolfpack of NC State won a back-and-forth battle against the third-ranked team in the country, Oklahoma State. The Cowboys now fall to 2-2 two and two on the year. Why has Oklahoma State seemed to struggle in duels this year? You know, they just have a lot of holes in their in their lineup, inconsistent wrestlers. Number five, Eddie Clamara squeaked out a win against an unranked wrestler in an overtime win. And John Smith said earlier in the season that his is the key to his team winning this season will be consistency consistency throughout the year, and that will build up to March. All right, so who stepped up for the Wolfpack? I wouldn't say anyone really stepped up, Scott. I mean, NC State is just a better dual team right now than Oklahoma State. NC State doesn't have the big names uh, at the top of the rankings besides Jack and Gwizdowski. Uh, I just feel like they're well-balanced. Crutchmer, Marsteller, they just have struggled to begin this season. Well, who hasn't struggled? The head coach of the Wolfpack, Pat Papalizio. We caught up with him after the duel. I don't really get too caught up in the rankings or try not to. I think it's you know, it's good to know your competition is going to be competitive. I guess it gives you an idea where they're at. But I think we all know who's been in the sport long enough that everything, the final rankings come out in March. So, you know, we took some losses this weekend and we won some matches that we're going to see these guys again in uh, in the NCAA tournament. So, you know, it's it's just kind of like an exhibition match. It goes on the record, but in the end, a win in March is what really – comes down to what matters most. Our guys need to understand that. I think the older you get and the more you've been in the sport, the more you, you get that. All right, thanks, Coach. Speaking of upsets, Nishan Garrett, he defeated NCAA defending champ Cody Brewer at this last weekend's Cliff Keen invite. Is Garrett now the favorite at 33? You know, this early in the season, I... Beating Brewer the way he did, I mean, was mighty impressive, I must say. I mean, Brewer was up 7-2 to two and uh, with that huge lateral drop. So for Garrett to be relentless against Cody Brewer, who usually has that style, was pretty impressive. Well, we talked with uh, the mighty young man from Cornell after the win. I feel, I feel great. I feel... Um... I feel like I'm competing like I'm supposed to be competing. And, um, you know, but it's, it's again, it's, um, you know, all these things, it's, 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 it's easy to get excited and it's easy to get all pumped up about a win or, you know, resting well. But um, nothing matters until March. Everyone gets it. Like, we, every, every time we, we break down our, our um, you know, our group or, or the, we break down the practice, it's always like we always say all in. On three, one, two, three, all in, national champs on three, one, two, three, national champs. And so I really feel like, and I think they feel like, that we are actually doing that. All right, we go back to the action. Brewer bumped up to 141 for the All-Star Classic and defeated Dean Heil. He is currently the number one ranked wrestler in the country. Should Brewer now move back to 141? You know, I think if Cody is struggling to make weight on this uh, two-day event, three-day event, you know, maybe his body is telling that he needs to go up to 141. I, I personally think he is still the favorite at both weights. So this is something that we'll just have to monitor and see where he goes in and out of the lineup. And But he'll be ready in March wherever he goes. Well, Nathan Tomasello from Ohio State, well, he seems to have a lock on the 125-pound weight class. That was evident after he defeated the number three ranked Joey Dance from Virginia Tech. He is, for a sophomore, he continues to impress me. You know, this is easily the most competitive weight class this season. Nico Megalutis, Thomas Gilman, both will have have something to say. I guess you could say 141 is the most competitive, but you can't argue with uh, those guys at 125. All right, our next topic, Micah Jordan continues to climb the rankings ladders. We told you he was one of the top 10 freshmen you needed to watch in the preseason. Well, he had a big win in the semis over Solomon Chisco, who I know that you and Ross are very high on. Can he win a title? Without a doubt. You know, another freshman to, to look out for, though, is Joni McKenna from Stanford. He's one of my favorites. Kevin Jack and Dean Heil, they're obviously top one, top two. They can be switched any way it goes. So uh, they have just been the story of the college wrestling season so far. We've got a lot more wrestling to come. Right now, though, we're going to go to break. And as we do it, we're going to check out the UWW's Big Move of the Week.
Well, we've had a lot of big names on our various programs over the years, Tony, but they don't get any bigger than our next guest. He's 2012 Olympic gold medalist, a four-time world champ, and already one of the top wrestlers in U.S. history, Jordan Burroughs. Jordan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. All right. First, congratulations on the new baby. I heard Little Beacon is going to have a brother or a sister soon. True? Yes, we are. Uh, June 13th is actually the due date. So my wife and I, right now, she's about 13 weeks in her fr first trimester still. And we're excited. We're excited about the opportunity to grow the Burroughs legacy and create a family and for Beacon to have a possible new training partner in the family. And so you can't wrestle on your own. You need someone to shoot some double legs on. Well, you've obviously had a lot of competitive success, but I want to talk to you about some of your achievements off the mat, specifically the shoe deal you signed with Asics. Did you ever imagine that a product line with your name on it would be so widespread and so successful? I don't think you can ever imagine that you'd be as successful as you dream to be. And so as a young man, I just wanted to win a lot of wrestling matches. I never understood quite what it would entail to be a successful wrestler because I'm kind of in uncharted water, uncharted territory. And so I think of some of the greats before me that were highly marketable athletes. So obviously, Cale Sanderson and Henry Cejudo, Brandon Slay, all these guys that had wrestling shoes in the 21st century, but then also guys like John Smith, who was extremely successful, but it was before an era of social media. It was before an era of the internet and high marketability. And so to have friends from back at home walk into Sports Authority or Dick's Sporting Goods or Shields, any of these places and see not only my wrestling shoe, but a poster of me in the wrestling shoe aisle of such big box retail stores is unbelievable, indescribable. I love it. I love it. I appreciate it. I'm extremely grateful for it. But, you know, there's been a lot of work. It's been a lot of work to, it's not like they just were like, hey, bro, has you ever wrestled before? Okay, great. You can have your own shoe. Like, it's been a lot of work that's been going into this, uh, just this opportunity that I've created. And so we kind of create these opportunities for ourselves through years of hard work. And then to have such a large corporation recognize it and want to get behind it is, uh, is, I'm very happy, very thankful. Do you think that you should have to win a world or Olympic gold medal before you get a signature shoe? Um, no, I don't think so. Because if you look at the guys in the NBA, I mean, look at the guys that have shoes. I think of Blake Griffin, Kevin Durant, uh, Carmelo Anthony, Chris Paul, all these guys that have never won an NBA championship, but they are highly marketable athletes, you know, and there, it, realistically, if you had only guys that won the big show have shoes, then it'd be unfair to everyone else because there are guys who are marketable, guys who are, are great in the sport, but you shouldn't have to. We're already in a performance-based, incentive-driven sport. You have to win practically a world championship to get a large, substantial check at the end of the season. And so it's, it's, it's too much of that. If you look at all, all the other professional sports, a lot, there are a lot of guarantees, you know, a lot of guarantees for guys that not based on what they've done, but based on potential. So you don't market someone based on their accomplishments. You market them based on their potential to, to have accomplishments and to do cool things. And so when I think of guys like Kyle Dake and David Taylor and Jordan Oliver and Ed Ruth, all these young guys that are studs that have the potential to be great at some period of time, but people love them. People enjoy them. Kids want to be like them. Parents love watching them and inviting them to their camps to teach technique to their young men and women. And so I think it's necessary. I, can't, I don't think you can really pigeonhole it because essentially I'd be the only guy or myself and Varner would be the only guy with wrestling shoes. Well, the last time we saw you in action was the World Championships last September. What's your next event? I will be at the Yasar Dogu in Istanbul, Turkey. And I believe it's February... 9th or 10th, I'm not sure, don't quote me on the dates, but it's some time in that period of of uh, of dates. And so I'll be back there. Myself, James Green are going to go out and travel together, train and compete at that same event and then prepare for the Olympic trials. And so this is a big year for me. You know, the expectations are, are high now. Everyone knows who I am. They expect me to win. They expect me to perform at a high level, go out, dominate, win another Olympic gold medal. And so and I think about those things. And now I have to put myself in position to do those things. Well, we asked our own Dan Lobdell, the wrestling nomad, to write out a few questions for you. And he wants to know what you think about a fox catcher 2.0 or 
some kind of a super Olympic training center. Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't know if you guys have had the opportunity to read my latest blog um, about American wrestling and kind of where we've been in the last 20 to 25 years and kind of our, our fall from grace. I think in the late 80s, early 90s, we were a powerhouse. You know, I think back to 96 where we had Tom Brands and Kendall Cross, Kurt Angle, Bruce Baumgartner, uh, Kenny Monday, Townsend Saunders, all these amazing wrestlers that were bringing home medals regularly to now at the point where we're just hoping that we can bring home some medals each year. And the expectations aren't very high. We're just hoping for the best. And so how do we go from that point in our history where we were a dominant world power to being relegated to outside of the top five? I mean, the only reason we were able to wrestle in the World Cup this past year was because we were the host, you know, because we placed outside of the top eight this past year. And so that's a bummer for me. I don't want to be regarded as a seventh place team. I think it's completely unacceptable and the resources that we spend and put into our program don't bring the results that they should. And so I think a Fox Catcher 2.0 is just this grand showcase of all our best wrestlers, like this huge think tank, think tank where we've got all the facilities that we need, obviously a standalone facility, a number, numerous wrestling mats. We've got a sauna, a massage therapist, a physical therapist, um, strength and conditioning coaches. We've got multiple freestyle coaches full time that aren't dedicated to folk style for six months out of the season where they're full time freestyle coaches. We've got 20 to 25 guys who are all high level guys. I'm talking the top two or three guys at each weight class, not kind of, kind of not middle of the road guys. I mean, the, the best guys our country has to offer, the best coaches. And I think we need this camaraderie and this consolidation to really get this country going as a whole. We're too compartmentalized. I just think about the best guys are in so many different RTCs, so many different places, and these resources are only being individualized into these little pockets of wrestling throughout the country. But if we could bring these resources together, create a living wage for the wrestlers who are actually interested in going to this Foxcatcher 2.0, I think it could be huge, essentially for America moving forward. We got a lot of young guys who are hungry and chopping at the bit to get an opportunity to kind of create a resurgence in this country's ability to win medals yearly. And so I, I, I want to lead that charge. I hope that I can be a part of it. I don't want it to kind of be one of those things like, all right, I initiated it, but I missed the train because I was a little too old. But I think it's something that before I step off the mat in Tokyo in 2020, like I want to have this thing in order and I want to be a part of it. And so whether the location's in Lincoln, Nebraska, Philadelphia, PA, Los Angeles, California, or Miami, Florida, wherever the location is to be agreed upon, I think this needs to be something where all wrestlers from throughout the country leave their allegiances and their alliances with their alma maters and say, all right, this is for the greater good of the country. I love the University of Nebraska, and it, I'll never root or cheer or be aligned with any other collegiate program, but at the end of the day, the U.S. is what's most important to me. You know, and so over the red, I'm a bigger fan of the red, white, and blue. Um, and, you know, I, essentially, I think that's that's necessary for people to be in. And I think it's got to be a a, a a collaborative effort from a number of people. Whether we can do it or not is still yet to be determined, but I think it's possible. Well, here's a little Christmas promo for you, Jordan. Check out the new JB Elites available on Amazon asics.com the big box stores around the world and of course your favorite wrestling retailer it's a perfect gift for the wrestler in your life thanks for the time keep doing what you're doing man we'll talk to you soon all right i appreciate that man thank you very much for the call and uh go usa all right when we return people will get pegged with eggs what are we talking about you're watching global wrestling news stay tuned While all around the country, wrestling fans and supporters are getting yoked for Rio when they send in a video of themselves cracking or smashing an egg on their head. That, of course, in support of USA Wrestling's quest for gold in Rio. Let's take a look at some of our favorites from the last week. Let's get yoked for Rio. <laughs> My name is Brandon Slay, 2000 Olympic gold medalist. 
and I'm here to accept USA Wrestling's Get Yoke for Rio Challenge. Now we're doing this to raise support to maximize our medal count at the Olympic Games in Rio. I'm going to support this cause, but I'm also challenging Jordan Burroughs, David Taylor, and Kyle Snyder. <laughs> Get yoked for Rio. Hi everybody, this is the women's wrestling national team and we are calling out Olympic medalist Ronda Rousey for the Get Yoked for Rio. I'm Alyssa Lampy and I'm calling out Johnny Hendricks. Since I'm wearing a Hawkeye shirt, Dan Gable. I'm Whitney Connor and I'm calling out Chris Weidman. All right. Okay, so now what's next, girls? Get Yoked for Rio. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Adeline Gray and Alyssa Lampy will compete in a new professional wrestling league in India. An athlete auction was held in early November where each team bid on wrestlers to fill their squads. Adeline Gray was selected early on by the team from Mumbai, while Alyssa Lampy was later chosen by the team from Bangalore. It's being reported this league could distribute upwards to $3 million to athletes during the 18-day league. Did you hear me say it? Three million dollars. Three million dollars. So there was 159 athletes in this auction, but only 54 were selected. You know, if if wrestlers, you know, by my math, they could possibly get paid around fifty-five thousand dollars on this. I, I'm not really sure all the details on it, but that's a lot of money. Other countries like Iran and Germany have had professional leagues would have featured athletes from many nations. Now, if the India League catches on, could we see something like this in the U.S.? You know, from what I've I've heard, there's already talks of something similar to this, where there's an auction for you know already club teams out there. Um, they give a salary, just like what they're trying to do over there. But I like what I what I like about the India thing. What they're doing is it's starting on the 9th and it gets over on the 27th. Every single day, there's going to be a duel, and then there's a semis or a, you know a quarterfinals, semis, and finals that lead up to the you know the big show. So I like that. Well, was Hager right about Michigan State? Stick around. We'll talk more about it after the break. You're watching Global Wrestling News. All right, welcome back to the show. A topic that seems to be all over social media and the forums this week is the state of the Spartans. Michigan State was shut out in consecutive duels against both Eastern and Central Michigan. How is the team in the Big Ten so bad this early? You know, right now, I think the only person to blame is the administration. You, I mean, you can look at the coaches and, and what they've done in the past, but at the end of the day, those the administration are the ones that are got to make those tough calls. I think we have to give more props to Eastern Michigan and, and, and Central Michigan. Everyone's hounding on Michigan State, but no one's giving props to those teams. They just assume that, you know, they're, Michigan State's bad, but maybe Central Michigan and Eastern Michigan are just better. Another Big Ten team picked up two losses last week to both Princeton and Ryder. One thing to note is two-time NCAA All-American Jason Sertzis was out of the lineup. Is Northwestern trending towards the bottom like Michigan State? Are they in trouble? I mean, I feel like we're talking so many things that are negative about Northwestern ever since this Drew Periano firing. You know, yes, Jason was out. You know, it was noted last week that he has some you know, off-the-mat distractions. I, I think they maybe wanted him just to sit out after you know he, he had that tough match at the grapple at the Garden. You know, what really confuses me is how a Big Ten team can forfeit three weights to a team like Ryder. I mean, three. I mean, that, that's a maybe one or two forfeits you can see, but this is Division I wrestling. There should be never three forfeits. Well, I understand they do have a cap, as so many programs do, on the total number of athletes that can be in the room. Of course, that's all a financial consideration, but... I can't believe a Big Ten team can't find somebody to fill those weights. Well, whether you're in the Big Ten or MAC, and this is Division I wrestling, and you should never have a forfeit, like I said, and, you know, let alone three. Well, here in just a few weeks, wrestling returns to Las Vegas, Nevada, December 17th through the 19th, and it's the U.S. Open. Hollywood Wayne Boyd offers his opinion on this exciting event. Well, it's it's a major qualifier for the U.S. Olympic uh, final trials, which are happening in Iowa in April. So they're going to qualify in three classes, women's, Greco, and freestyle, uh, six weight classes, seven deep. 
which means that's what six times seven thirty forty two wrestlers in each style four eight twelve that's a hundred and twenty six wrestlers are going to qualify for that final trials next weekend and as always Titan Mercury wrestling club is ready to go uh, we are having a team competition we're the defending champions we've won the last three years in a row we're going we're going for a fourth all right tony we're out of time so for our executive producer andrew f barth our producer wayne eric boyd and my partner in crime tony hager i'm scott casper wishing you and yours a very merry christmas and a happy holiday season we'll see you next week right here on global wrestling news